was äh, heißt der letzte Aufschlag an diesem Wochenende hier am Nürburgring bedeutet in der Division 4 Series, da in der jetzt im Rennen gesehen, dürfen alle so melden, die Joe Rickwurst sehen, darf hier am Rücken mit uns die Information sein. Das ist der Tipp der Startaufstellung des Vollsetters und Startfahrer. We're looking down on the grid for round 10 of the GT4 European Series. And there is a car that was quick in race one in the hands of Hakan Rickness. He will start this race from ninth on the grid. Hakan Rickness was involved in the lead battle early on in the first race. Then the car cut out coming out of the chicane. And ultimately, he finished the race in fifth place. The Swede won to watch, I suspect, in this as he lines up alongside the double spa winner, Pavel Leftorov, with the Lotus Evora. The European GT4 Series with just two more races to go after this at Masano. Their first race this morning won by Peter Turting and Carsten Struve in a race that was brought to a premature close because the fog set in. And there, looking down on the grid, the next row missing the sin of Hendrik Steele, but it does have Jörg Vibarn's BMW. The next row also, I think, has lost a car because we have uh, Milton Lundström, but by the look of it, I'm not convinced that we have... 28, the deep mile lacking a Jan Kasperlik BMW that retired from race one. And then the back row should have Oscar Kruger, but uh, Stefan Kuss with his sin not taking the start either. But we are without sin, therefore, neither of the cars taking to the grid. But they had a damper problem in qualifying and elected not to take part in either of the two races. Whereas the BMW, if I'm right in saying it's not there, of Jan Kasperlik retired uh, just before the end, in fact, of the first race, pitted for reasons unknown. It was all a bit of a mystery as to why the car had come in and it's not ventured back out again. 16 there is Daniel Luckerman, who is the man who leads the uh, AM driver element of the championship. The championship having a pro and an AM class. Daniel Luckerman on 188 points ahead of Pavel Lefterov on 136. In the pro competition, Jelle Bielen and Marcel Nuren are the leaders on 172. Duncan Hausman second on 134 and Jörg Vibarn. Third on 131. Race one this morning, won impressively by Peter Turting, who admitted it's been a long time since he had a race winner's trophy. He took over Carsten Struve's Porsche and was able to bring it through for the race win. Second, Jörg Vibarn, who benefited as the race wore on, as others had problems and from uh, his own ability. And then also third place was the BMW of Simon Knapp and Rob Severs. The race, which is good to see, is going to be a conventional start. It's not a safety car start, it's the rolling start. So at the end of this lap, they will be in business. And the cars now working their way up through the right-hander. Turn one, the Mercedes Arena. The pole position car is in the hands of Ricardo van der Ender, which is the Ecris Motorsport BMW, a car that was seventh in the earlier race this morning. Ricardo van der Ender, former winner of the Formula Ford Festival, hugely experienced driver, but these days specialising really in Dutch saloon and GT racing. Uh, never bet against him. The same is true of Duncan Hausman, who will start third on the grid. Between the two, though, is the little Chevron, Marcus Clutton at the wheel. And the British driver, certainly one to watch. The Chevron went well in his and Jordan Witt's hands earlier on in the day. This is how the grid looked. Van der Ender, Clutton, Hausman, Terting, Sasha Halleck, ahead of Daniel Uckerman, Jelle Bielen, Simon Knapp, Harkin Rickness, Pavel Lefteroff, ignore 11th because non-starting is Henrik Still. So then it is going to be the car of Jörg Vibarn ahead of Milton Lundström. And then the only other one I think we have on the grid is that of uh, Oscar Kruger. So it is a slightly uh, thinner grid as the cars work their way through this formation lap behind the pace car as it is at the moment. The race shortly to get underway. And there is a car to watch, Harkin Rickness in the Porsche. But the way that they went in the first race would make you think that Carsten Struve and Peter Terting are going to be very hard to beat here. Terting particularly in this first stint, look, he's on his toes already, getting himself up level, ready for the two-by-two -two rolling start with Duncan Hausman. The Chevron in the hands of Marcus Clutton should be another car to watch as well as they head uphill. Headlights ablaze, this European GT4 series with this great mix of cars. It's just a shame that more people don't come and do it because it's a championship with a limited number of rounds but lots of track time, so it's good cost-wise. The venues are all good, and because you can have a co-driver, you can split the costs. Lots and lots of eligible cars on the market, so it just needs that final bit of oomph, that final click to really deliver. But on track, the racing is always good, and with a real spread of winners across the year. 
this second race at the Nürburgring is about to get underway as the field then makes its way up towards the Coca-Cola curve. The pace car as it is will peel into the pit lane and then we are going to be good to go. Duncan Hausman on the second row in the big Chevrolet looking pretty menacing. Uh, he has been a driver that's had a victory this year. The other uh, Camaro in the hands of Yellow Beal and Marcel Noren has been victorious. We've not yet though this year had a BMW victory. Ricardo van der Ender and Bernard van Oranje aim to change that as this race of 50 minutes plus one lap gets underway. Down they head towards turn one and it's the BMW that's just got the advantage but here comes Hausman swatting aside the traffic as he charges through the pack down towards the first corner into the Mercedes arena. Jörg Vibarn's blue BMW is also quickly trying to work its way up the order as they head now down through turn number one. So van der Ende leads. And look at Peter Turting up into third. He's right round the outside there, almost running out of road. Sasha Halleck in the yellow and black KTM crossbow, also in a big, big hurry. And it's going to be van der Ende from Turting from Hausman. Then three very experienced, very accomplished drivers leading the way out of the Mercedes arena for the first time. Pavel Lefterov there up the kerb as he tries to get past Daniel Luckerman. That should give Jörg Vibarn a chance to have a go as they work their way down towards the hairpin for the first time. Peter Turting trying to go around the outside of Ricardo van der Ender. Is he going to be able to stand his ground? If he can do that, he'll be on the inside line for the next corner. He's up the kerb and he's through. Great move by Peter Turting right around the outside there. Superb bit of driving. Turting in the Porsche leads. And now, is he going to be able to make good his escape? Second is van der Ender. Third and sideways is Hausman. Fourth is Simon Knapp. Fifth is Clutton. 50 minutes plus a lap. Mandatory pit stops between 20 and 30. And it's a 90 second stop. As here's the replay of Sasha Halleck getting it a little bit overzealous down towards the hairpin. Running off the road altogether. That was trying to get past Duncan Hausman. And Sasha Halleck way, way wide. Eventually finds a run, or does he, back towards the circuit? Not entirely convinced he does. No, has to hook reverse gear and get it through the gap there in the barrier. So Peter Turting leading the way, pulling clear of the opposition as he works his way now up towards the end of the lap. The rain falling again here at the Nürburgring, even though the fog has just passed through for the moment. So visibility is not too bad. Turting leads the way as he comes up over the timing line. This is the car that started fourth on the grid, and he leads the way at the end of the lap. In second place is Ricardo van der Ender, third in the Chevrolet, Camaro, it's Duncan Hausman. The BMW behind is Simon Knapp in the second of the Ecaris cars. Fifth is Marcus Clatton. Then in sixth place is the Lotus Evora of Pavel Lefterov. Seventh is Jörg Vibar. Eighth in the black KTM, Daniel Uckerman. And only ninth, Jelle Bielen, the ex-Formula Ford racer, struggling at the moment to make progress. And look at Simon Knapp. He's about to try and make a move under braking, but Duncan Hausman knows that he's coming and covers the line. That big Chevrolet might look a bit unwieldy, particularly in the wet, but Hausman is a real master of this. Very accomplished touring car driver, Duncan Hausman. The car's set off then now down towards the hairpin once more into the right-hander, up to the outside line comes the BMW, and Hausman breaks as late as he dares. That line means he's going to slither out wide. Can Simon Knapp get up the inside of him coming out of the corner? The answer is no. Sideways there, look, coming into the Bill Stein curver, and Hausman is going to be lucky to hang on to this because right with him, Simon Knapp. Of course, van der Ender is getting away up front now. He's building the advantage while they're all squabbling behind him. Up the curb goes Hausman. It's a real handful, that car. But Simon Knapp trying to urge the BMW up alongside. Is this the move in the Ad Van Bogen? Hausman is out wide, two wheels onto the dirt there. He's absolutely on the limit as he tries to fend off Simon Knapp. They break now into the NGK chicane. And Hausman sideways as he puts down the power, keeping Simon Knapp, former Formula Ford and Ferrari racer in the Blanc Pan Endurance Series at bay. Simon Knapp, the Dutch driver, underfunded, underrated, quick driver, heads up towards the line. Peter Tertin goes through. It'd be great to see Peter in GT3 machinery because he's certainly a very, very accomplished driver. Spent a brief period in the DTM for Audi, for Seat in the World Touring Car Championship. There's the battle behind as through goes the... Camaro, it is still Hausman just being able to fend off Knapp, but Peter Turting is just driving away into the distance. Carsten Struve will take the car over, but Turting is going to give him a mighty lead, isn't he? After his rally crossing, by the way, uh, Sasha Halleck back into the race. Simon Knapp through into third place, up on the inside. Or is he? Because Hausman tries to defend as best he can. 
and he's going to get back through on the inside of the next corner. And there's one car, incidentally, that's missing at the end of the lap. Harkin Rickness has not come by. So once again, the Porsche with problems, as now Knapp does make the move stick down to the hairpin. He's gone through up into third place. So keep your eyes peeled. No, Harkin Rickness has just come over the timing line, so he's a very, very badly delayed 13th is the Swede. Whether it was a mistake, whether it was a mechanical issue, we don't yet know, but... If it was a mistake, there could well be a replay of him in strife. So the sideways houseman has lost out now relative to Simon Knapp, who's up into that third place. Big, big opposite lot moment there. Look from the Camaro as houseman powers on behind. He needs the road to dry out a little bit. He shares the car with Luke Brahms, who's not as quick. In fact, in most cases, you've got the faster driver doing this stint. So the second part of the race will be intriguing because you'll start to see who the better AMs are. These are notionally the pro drivers. In some cases, drivers are very hard to separate in terms of their ability and experience, but one has to be designated the pro and the other the am. In the case of Peter Terting, he's very much the pro, even though Carsten Struve did for a time race in the DTM. There is Simon Knapp fending off Duncan Hausman as they work their way over the timing line. Through they go. And then behind them, in fourth place, uh, sorry, in fifth place, Pavel Lefterov now, ahead of Marcus Clutton, the little chevron dropping away in the wet. I don't think it's as happy in the wet as it is in the dry. Great fight, this, for third place. Hausman has by no means given up. He's back up alongside Simon Knapp's BMW as they wriggle their way through the Mercedes arena. And while they're squabbling, other drivers that went well in race one, struggling in race two, Jörg Wiebahn, a long way back in 11th place. Hausman then back up into third. Too much speed carried into turn three, slithers out wide. Back up the inside of him now comes the BMW, but he can't find a way through there. So now Knapp has to line up to have a go down towards the hairpin. He's got the inside line. He should get the place back again, but this is what it should all be about, trading the place corner after corner. Knapp up the inside, through he goes. Powers out of the corner ahead. Now, can Hausman get back through once again? He has a look on the inside going into the Bilstein curve. That doesn't pay off for him. And so as they sprint their way now through the next right-hander and get onto the power, the Chevrolet Camaro up the curb and thunders its way now on towards the Advan Bogen. Through they come. While they've been squabbling for third place, number one, Ricardo van der Ender has got away, but he's only second because up the road, Peter Terting is very nearly in race one at Misano, such is the advantage that he's got. And there, Hausman back up the inside of Knapp. Lunged at the inside. Knapp saw him coming at the last moment, had to back out of that and has lost momentum look. So Hausman is third and by quite some margin coming through the Coca-Cola curve. Good, good move pulled by Hausman. Years of experience did that. And these cars in these conditions, great to watch because they're sideways almost everywhere. They're not designed to run on rails like a GT3 car would, for example. And the BMW and the Camaro, certainly the BMW, more akin to a touring car. So they're meant to get sideways. And it's a great spectacle, this, in the wet. Down to turn one, Hausman with a tight line in, powering away now. But what can he do, if anything, about the man up the road ahead of him, Ricardo van der Ender? Terting, he's lapping quicker than everybody. You won't be surprised to learn that. He's building up the gap. Here is the lunge that came, and Hausman turns in alongside, and Knapp thinks, eek, that's a big car alongside me, and has to get out of the way. So Hausman through, and then Knapp has to drop it down a gear or two and pick up momentum. Behind them, Pavel Lefterov, fifth in the Lotus. Now, he led briefly in race one, only to get a stop-go penalty for too short a pit stop. But number 18, Peter Terting, working his way serenely away from the opposition up front at the moment. The 911 GT4, Cayman-esque in its appearance, powers on. And Peter Terting now having a pretty lonely time. In race one, he had to catch and pass and then pull away from the opposition. Here, he's done that all in the space of the first three laps. So clear road ahead of him. There in second place, Ricardo van der Ender. But then you get to the relative pace of the co-drivers. Is a Bernhard van Oranje quicker than a Carsten Struve, for example. Can the gap come down? Often there's more disparity among the AMs, so a good AM can be very, very important indeed. Race leader has just gone through as you look at third, fourth, fifth, and then sixth, the little white chevron coming through of Marcus Clutton. Peter Terting through in the lead of the race. The gap that he's got now is 9.6 seconds over Ricardo van der Ender. In third place, Duncan Hausman goes by, being pursued in turn by Simon Knapp. 
And then you've got Pavel Lefterov running fifth, and in sixth place, Marcus Clatton. Frustratingly, three cars not starting this race, but those that we have on track battling hard. Another fight lower down, Jörg Vibarn still 11th, but the recovering Sasha Halleck getting onto the back of him now. Pavel Lefterov in the Lotus, lapping last time fractionally quicker than Simon Knapp. So this is another car worth watching. Don't forget, of course, that it's a solo driver effort. So Pavel Lefterov's car will be able to run at a consistent pace all the way through the race. He's not dependent on the pace of a co-driver to affect the result for better or for worse. So Lefterov doing a decent speed at the moment. Is he going to be quicker than Carson Struve? Can he, for example, come back into the mix as the race wears on? The Bulgarian won both races at Spa. And the Evora in proper Lotus pseudo JPS colours there, fending off Marcus Clatton. Marcus, another underrated British driver, very, very quick in club level Porsche racing. He's been successful in the British GT Cup and makes this car absolutely fly. Chevron these days owned by his co-driver Jordan Witt's father, David, but go back to the 1960s, it was Derek Bennett who started it. And although they made some single-seaters and had a Formula 5000 car that beat the Formula 1 machinery in the race of champions in 1973 for Peter Geffen, it was in sports car racing that Chevron really made its name. And things like the B8 and the B16 in particular, some of the prettiest sports cars of the time. And this little Chevron, diminutive in appearance, it's got the sort of bodywork at the back, redolent of the old B8 is a quick car. Now lower down the order, Yella Bielan looking for a way up the inside of the BMW in the hands there, up towards the line of Oscar Kroger, the Swedish driver. They come over the timing line this lap through. In fact, Kroger has got himself up past, I uh, apologies, Milton Lundström. So it's the Lundström BMW. Kroger's is the black and orange car there. Behind him is Lundström. But Jelle Bielen, who is certainly not an inexperienced driver, really struggling, it seems, with the car in these conditions. He will give way to Marcel Nuren for the second stint. But Jelle Bielen just not really being able to get the most out of that car for the moment at any rate. Bielen, who has raced in the... Dutch Suzuki Swift Championship, as well as Formula Ford. He was at the Formula Ford Festival many years ago. He's raced in the Euro Cup McGann Trophy. So he knows about powerful cars, and he should know about slippery conditions, but it's not hooking up for him here. Down towards the hairpin. Big lock-up. Very, very wide goes Oscar Kruger, but he's able to hang on to that and fend off the challenge of Milton Lundström behind him in a big, big sideways moment for Yellow Beal, and it's great to watch. But look how much time that's cost him. Slithers his way out of the hairpin. But all of these cars looking terribly, terribly edgy now. It is a wet road. They're trying to get the power down as best they can, but the cars will snap away if it uh, means the driver has applied the power just that fraction too soon. Porsches at the moment bookending the order. Peter Terting leading and Hakan Rickenas. So much for him being a man to watch down in last place after dramas early on. Look at the amount of spray being generated again on the run up to the chicane. It's very wet and treacherous over there. The leading gap is 12 and a half seconds. Van der Ender is now being caught by Hausman for second place. In fourth place is Simone Knapp, who's kind of settling for fourth, I think, now. In fifth place, Pavel Lefterov. Sixth is Marcus Clutton. Daniel Uckerman is seventh. And then this is eighth, ninth, tenth over the line. Kruger ahead of Lundström, ahead of Bielen. In 11th place now is Sasha Halleck. In 12th is Jörg Vibarn having a dreadful race by his high standards. Jörg Vibarn, whose season started in an Aston Martin, that was destroyed at the Red Bull Ring in big accident in the uh, race there. And he collided with the sin at the end of the race. But rather than drop out of the championship, a home has been found for him in the BMW that early season was due to be driven by Lisette Brahms until her illness got in the way. But Lisette did do a few laps in free practice two incidentally this weekend which was great to see as she uh, battles against her cancer and it was a huge psychological step forward to be back on track and it was uh, great for everybody involved in the championship to see but Jörg Vibarn doing the races solo really to try and just keep getting points well here he's going to have to do some work in the second stint which he might well be able to do up against perhaps some of the slower am drivers but for the moment, he's definitely a long way down the order. The BMWs continue to squabble as Oskar Kruger fends off Milton Lundström. Jörg Vibarn, just going back to him for the, a moment, third at Magaro in race one, followed by an eighth at Magaro. That's in the 
Aston Martin. Then the championship uh, went to Zanvoort. He had a fifth place in both races there, so he'd been consistent. Then uh, second in race one at the Red Bull Ring, but then there was the huge accident at the very end that took him out of that race, having uh, collided with the Sin at the last corner. So the championship started OK, but then certainly deteriorated. And in the BMW, which perhaps is not quite as quick as some, maybe not in the hands of just one driver anyway, Vibar not having the advantage that he's experienced in the past with the Aston Martin. Now, Daniel Luckerman, in the meantime, in his KTM, running in seventh, is he being caught by Oscar Kruger? Not on that lap, he's not. Behind, though, Milton Lundström is being caught again by Jelle Bielen. Lundström, Swedish GT racer. He's raced in the Danish and the Benelux and the European Formula Ford categories over the years, so another experienced driver is Lundström. And like a lot of young talents that ran out of money, he then finds a berth wherever he can to go racing. So the Swedish GT4 Championship is where he is these days. And there, Jelle Bielen hustling on the Camaro. It's a real old fight, that. Sideways out of the corner. Car number four being warned about track limits. That's Jörg Vibarn having just been talking about him. So Vibarn getting a little bit carried away. It's interesting, actually, the only, only race all weekend that we've had track limits warnings has been this GT4 category. And Jörg Vibarn is the driver at the moment attracting attention from the officials. Now there is Peter Terting, keeping the tyres cool on the wet parts of the road. This section, certainly wetter than others. We've had more rain seemingly up at the top end of the circuit rather than down at the hairpin, for example. So Peter Terting goes through, approaching the pit window, which opens once we have had 20 minutes. It's a 50-minute race plus a lap. It's not quite as frantic as we had in the early stages. It's now started to settle down a little bit, but we're not done yet, that's for sure, because when you get the second drivers in, the whole picture of the race can change in a twinkling. Down towards turn one goes Ricardo van der Ender and Duncan Hausman right behind him, so that means the battle now for second and third places is well and truly joined. The field working its way up out of the Mercedes Arena from turn two to turn three. Bear in mind that a few laps back, Hausman was struggling and being passed and losing places. He then fought back, and he's getting himself more home, I think, once again with the Chevrolet Camaro, perhaps also because now the track condition's just a little bit better. That might be helping, because certainly in the wet, it's a big, powerful brute of a car to hustle around. But Hausman, down at the hairpin, where, again, there's lots of rain on the camera lens, comes out still pursuing the BMW. Working their way uphill once again. A sideways van der Ender loses a length, also loses momentum, and then up the kerb and sideways goes Hausman. Great battle this as they're both fighting for traction. Hausman trying to get up the inside as the Camaro wags its tail coming out of the corner. Up the kerb it goes. But Ricardo van der Ender hangs onto the place, and while they're doing all of this battling, so of course Peter Terting is getting away up front. Into the braking zone again comes Hausman. A very, very sideways as he hits the kerb and off the road, van der Ender. He's got to drop it down a gear. Is this Hausman's opportunity to challenge? No, van der Ender knows exactly what the game is. He moves across and covers that line going into the corner, but Hausman does make the move now up the inside. He's got a slightly better run, I think, out of the corner. Van der Ender's going to get run up towards the kerbs, but he keeps his foot in. Two of Holland's most experienced drivers, really, here, battling together. And Duncan Hausman looking for the inside line on the run down towards the first corner into the braking zone, Camaro versus BMW, the Chevrolet will go through up on the inside line, so Duncan Hausman now into second spot. Race one was really disappointing because Luke Brahms lost heaps of time early on and never really got into the mix, so Hausman was limited in what he could do, and in the end, ninth was the result here. He's very much in the mix, but he's about to lose second place as van der Ender goes back up on the inside, heading down towards turn three. Duncan Hausman tries now to fight back. He gets the outside line. He wants the slingshot for the inside down to the hairpin, but the tail wagging BMW ahead just hangs on to the place. If Peter Turton could hang around, he'd enjoy a great battle here, but he's so far up the road. So van der Ende defends from Hausman down towards the hairpin, and he's still ahead coming out of the corner. Pit window to open in 56 seconds time. And tempting fate, we've managed to get this far without any interruptions. Over the kerb again is van der Ende. 
and sideways with a very mud splattered front now look is Duncan Houseman. That shows how much the two of them have been running wide and off the road. All the muck and the dirt and the soil and the mud thrown into the front of the Camaro. The BMW working its way again up towards the chicane. They'll have to squeeze another lap out of this, even if they wanted to pit. And up the inside goes Houseman, and this time it works for him. Just enough of a gap, but he prizes it open, so through goes Houseman. But Van der Ende tries to get back at him on the inside line. Can the BMW break later? No, it can't. But is Houseman going to be able to get the power down well enough to drag the car out of the corner and keep Van der Ende behind him? It looks like the answer is yes, because he's ahead by a couple of lengths as they head up towards the timing line now. Through they go. The pit window is now open. Leaders go by. In fourth place, Simon Knapp still. Pavel Leftrov will be through in fifth place. And here, a replay of how Hausman made that move. Look, there's barely enough room, but eventually Van der Ende moves across to try and claim the racing line, and Hausman keeps on coming, breaks as late as he dares, and up the inside he goes. Place gained. So the pit window open, nobody is yet electing to come in. Of course, where the quicker driver starts, and that's in most cases in this race, then you'll want to keep him out for as long as possible. It's only in the case of the soloists like V-Barn or Lefterov that you might come in early and get it out of the way. There's another replay of Hausman getting the position away from Ricardo van der Ender. So 29 minutes, and of course it's plus a lap at the end, the regulation for this championship. Peter Terting leading the way, and such is his pace that he's actually not that far away from lapping Hakan Ricknas's la uh, last placed Porsche that lost time early on and has never really looked as though it's going to get it back, unfortunately. Great shame because Ricknas is certainly not a slow driver. There in second spot, Duncan Hausman. Now, having been released from behind Van der Ender, he's shaking off the BMW, isn't he? But I don't think necessarily he's going to be able to do anything about Peter Terting because uh, Terting is doing laps in the 46s. Hausman, at best, has been in the 48s. Up they come. Over the timing line, Jordan Witt there getting ready to take over the Chevron and Marcus Clutton that's in sixth place. Pavel Lavrov comes in, so the solo driver going to get that pit stop out of the way and that he can carry on. He loses, of course, track position for the moment to Clutton in the Chevron. Pavel Lavrov down the pit lane. Daniel Luckerman will go past him as well. So also will be the charging Oscar Kruger in the BMW. Right, so Lavrov stops. Also in has come... Uh, Sasha Halak, having had it off right at the very start of the race. So, the race leader heading up towards the NGK chicane once more, with ahead of him on the road, perhaps to be lapped, Harkin Ricknas. Those two cars in the pit lane, Sasha Halak and... Pavel left her off, KTM and Lotus in the pit road. What about Terting? Nope, he's just going for the wet parts of the road, looking after the tyres, doing the absolute consummate job as the pro driver helping the AM because the idea is to give him the tools with which to win the race. And that means not only a big lead, but tyres still in good condition. And therefore, by maintaining a good pace on a wet road, he's looking after the tyre wear. He's not stressing them at all. So Peter Terting, I hope we see more of him in GT racing because he's been... Uh, be good to sort of remind oneself of how good a driver Terting has been this weekend. He's certainly reminded people of his ability. Having had his first race win in a long, long time, works his way then up past the pits. The gap he's got 21 seconds over uh, Duncan Houseman. And in fact, Terting has just done the fastest lap of the race. Harkin Ricknas in the pit lane, serving the mandatory 90 second pit stop time. Quick word on the radio to the team, but. There's clearly something not right with that car because in two races it's lost chunks of time early on. Down the pit road comes the Marcus Clatton Chevron. Driver change time here. Jordan Witt will take over. Marcus Clatton, very, very rapid. Jordan Witt, no slouch. He's one of the pace setters in Pro Am 1 of Carrera Cup GB. He'll be in action at Knock Hill in a week's time. 
Out gets MC, Marcus Clatton, with his very distinctive crash helmet. The team looking at the stopwatches, counting down the stop. And it's 90 seconds pit in to pit out, so it's all got to be done properly, this. The car overseen by Peter Hignett, experienced race engineer. The Chevron's operated these days by Redline Racing, Simon Leonard's Yorkshire team. So it's a good northern setup, this. Marcus Clatton from Oldham, Jordan Whit from Nutsford in Cheshire. And it's his dad, David, that owns the Chevron brand these days. So engine will fire up in a moment. Pit window, of course, still open for another five minutes, but those that haven't yet stopped need to be mindful of where they are relative to the clock. The leader already through, Peter Terting, he will do the maximum, and when he hands over the car to Carsten Struve, it will be with a very big lead, but whether anybody can lap massively quicker than Struve and hack away, we'll have to wait and see. The one to watch could well be Lefter of, though, because he is still hustling on, and we saw at Spa that he's a quick driver. There, back into the race goes the Chevron. The Chevron GT4, sort of grown out of the GR8 that was the first homologation GT car that they built. And back on track then goes the Chevron, Jordan Witt at the wheel of it. Careful not to cross the blend line there, the white line, as he comes down to turn one. And there into the pit lane is Daniel Luckerman. That's the car that was in sixth place, so Oscar Kruger has just gained a spot. Also coming in, Yella Bielen. And I think now we're going to have a real rush of cars into the pit road. So for Daniel Luckerman, it is just sit there and wait. For one or two of the others, there will be a driver change. Yella Bielen there will give way to Marcel Nuren. In he comes, car stops. Marcel Nuren wanders over, ready to hop on board. And out gets Yella Bielen. Marcel Nuren, another experienced BMW Championship racer and Dutch GT racer, Carsten Struve, preparing himself. He's had a win already today, but the German driver receives his car now because down the pit road comes Peter Terting. Carsten Struve goes back to the uh, early 1980s when he started racing in the Renault 5 Turbo Championship in Germany. He had a spell in the 21 Turbo Championship. He's racing the DTM in the European Ferrari Challenge and now into GT4. So Peter Terting arrives with a very big lead indeed. Out he gets. Off you go, Carsten, he says. And as Daniel Uckerman rejoins the race, we'll see at the end of the next lap exactly what sort of margin uh, Carsten Struve has to try to preserve to the end of the race. Now, anybody else for the pit lane? In, I think, has come Simon Knapp. So for the moment, it's going to give us Hausman as the race leader. There is the yellow helmet of Rob Severs about to get into the 8 BMW. Simon Knapp out. Ekris, the team running these cars. And Carsten Struve is about to get going then. So the countdown continues. And in a moment, the Porsche will be allowed back down the pit lane. That 90 seconds includes the drive time, so they've got to time it absolutely right. They don't want it to be a second early. As we saw from the earlier race, if you are short on the pit stop, then there's a stop-go penalty. So back into the race goes the race-leading Porsche, Carsten Struve at the wheel of it. And their look is Hakan Ricknas, who has just got a lap down. A very happy Peter Terting. <laughs> and pointing out his sponsor proudly. So the two Porsches, one a lap up on the other, wriggle their way up through the Mercedes Arena. Harkin Ricknas then going down a lap. Down the pit road comes the very brief race leader, Duncan Hausman. Also in comes Ricardo van der Ender. So the next pit stop cycle through. 
and we'll see in a moment or two what this is going to do to their race position once they get back out on track because for the moment they have to serve the pit stop then of course we're going to have the car of Carson Struva back across the timing line will it be in the lead will it have lost much ground it should be in the lead it will be only a disaster that would really stop it from maintaining the advantage after uh, the pit stops but really it's the margin that we need to see so Ricardo van der Ender gives way to Bernhard van Orania and very shortly that car will be ready to go so too as the pit window oh now pit window is closed Jörg Vibarn has only just made it in in time because that car Admittedly, he had come into the pits, but only just as the pit window closed. So a bit touch and go for Jörg Vibarn. Uh, we'll have uh, Hausman giving way to Luke Brahms. That's what I was about to tell you. And Jörg Vibarn in. There, look, is the Porsche battle. One trying not to be lapped by the other, effectively. Away goes Brahms. Away goes Van Oranje. And Vibarn sitting in the background. So race order will be confirmed at the end of this lap everybody has made a pit stop as Pavel Lefterov goes across the timing line and he's right on the back of Rob Severs now so for sixth and seventh there's a good battle and that's about to become fourth and fifth as they head over the timing line because of other people still being in the pit lane so uh, Oscar Kruger yet to see his car rejoin in the hands of co-driver Thomas Martinson and also still in the pit lane Jörg Vibar so the order will continue to shuffle now Luke Brahms fresh into the Camaro here trying to get it in a straight line and hang on to all of that power behind him is Bernhard Van Oranje who lunges up the inside and has gone through but can he get the car slowed down no way Jose off he goes into the tyres hazard lights come on and now Bernhard Van Oranje has got to try and get it off the wet grass and get going again there is what happens when you try to be a hero on your first lap into a stint and he came from a long way back. It was never on that, was it? Massively too quickly into the corner. And then the moment of realisation comes as he tries to turn in. The back breaks away and wallop into the tyres he goes. Tries to drive forward. But thankfully, the rear wheel's on some tarmac there. So he did have something to bite and therefore drag the car uphill away from the tyres. But you could see it coming. There must be a wry smile in the helmet of Luke Brahms then because he left his rival racing room and just watched Van Aranya sail on by Wallop into the tyres. Meanwhile, Carsten Struther continues to dominate. That lap that he has done, a 152. Terting was doing 146s. Don't expect him to be as quick as his pro co-driver, but what we do need to look at, and you've interestingly now just seen Harkin Ricknas through shot, he's got back ahead and he's pulling away, that shows you the relative pace of the drivers, doesn't it, and makes you wonder what Ricknas could have done if he'd have not had his problems early on. Uh, the gap between the leaders then, between Struva and Brahms, 17 seconds. Interesting that, because it was quite a long gap before the pit stops, but it's come down to 17 seconds now. Race leader heads down towards the hairpin. Not aware of anybody being un under investigation for too short a pit stop as yet, so hopefully nobody's in strife, but either it was a very long stop by the Porsche team or it was a gentle inlap by Terti, which I find it hard to believe. But Carson Struva's advantage is not a colossal one. That said, we'll see whether he's able to stretch that over Luke Brahms as he gets into his stride. Carson Struva, a quick gentleman racer, very experienced, as I was saying before he took over the car, but somebody who these days is happy to go racing for fun rather than race necessarily in ultra-competitive championships, but he still wants to win, and he's got a good team around him here, and Peter Turting's not here just for fun. He too wants to be a race winner. They've marked up one victory earlier on in the day. There is the second-place car of Luke Brahms, but certainly the gap is a lot less than before the pit stops. Brahms then hustles on. What can he do about the race leader? Struva has gone by the lap, a 152.7 now, Carsten Struva at the wheel. So, well, that says Terting on the graphic, that's, of course, the start driver. Now we've had the pit stops. 
It is Carson Struver ahead. More track limits warnings now coming for Jordan Witt. There, number one, sorry, number, yes, one, I should say, is Bernhard van Oranje. Right, the lead gap, 17.4 seconds. Actually, Struver and Brahms, pretty evenly matched there. The gap only up by two tenths. For third place, it is Pavel Lefterov, and Lefterov is at the moment the quickest man on the circuit. So he's 22 seconds back, but he's lapping four seconds a lap quicker. Pavel Lefterov is still, I think, one to watch here. He's not out of the game at all. It's still possible that he might be able to get up with certainly the second place car of Luke Brahms before the end of the race. At the moment, Lefterov is working his way out of the Mercedes arena. He's only four and a half seconds back, so maybe catching the Porsche is too tall an order, but he's going to give it his best shot. Down towards the hairpin goes now the Camaro, being pursued by the Lotus, as up towards the Advan Bogan at turn eight uh, comes the leading Porsche. Into the chicane comes Hakan Ricknas, who is still, I'm afraid, in last place. He's not been able to catch anybody race long. Must be massively frustrating when you know you've got a quick base car, but there's just nothing that can be done. There, the race leader. Carsten Struve. In the Porsche 981, you've got their second and third almost together now. So Pavel Lefteroff almost up there now with the second place Chevrolet Camaro. Over the line has just gone Struve. That lap was a 52-2. So he's quickening his pace a little bit now. Possibly knowing that he's got to because he's uh, coming under attack relatively from Pavel Lavdorov, who does now make a move up on the inside and easily drives past Luke Brahms, having caught him. That did not look at all difficult, did it? Up the inside he goes. So down towards the hairpin they go then, through the right-hander at turn one. And the Lotus now powering away. So Pavel Lefterov is the man to watch because he is lapping nearly five seconds a lap quicker than the race leader. Pavel Lefterov here could yet get up with the race leader before the end. It's 13 minutes plus a lap, which is what, seven laps, eight laps? There should be just about enough time for Lefterov to get up onto the tail of the race leader, doing some very crude maths. There, Luke Brahms falling away a bit now in third spot. Now, is he going to be caught by anybody? Because behind him, Bernhard van Oranje is lapping quicker, but he's got to make up six seconds. Van Oranje ruining that mistake that put him off the road. If he'd abided his time, he would have been able to challenge again. But now the BMW driver having to play catch-up. There, though, is Pavel Levdorov, and he really is hustling on. Look at the way he's getting away now from Luke Brahms. The Chevrolet falling away behind as they head up through the right-hander at the Advan Bogen, and now once more into the braking zone for the chicane. Out of the Coca-Cola curve, turn 11, comes Lefteroff. That last lap from Struva was a 151. He is getting a bit quicker, but Lefteroff goes through and the gap is down to 14 seconds. It's on this, isn't it? Pavel Lefteroff hunting down the race leader. So as they head into turn one, the last thing that Struva needs now, of course, is a safety car, but I don't think we're going to be in that kind of a situation. There's no suggestion of, in fairness, people tripping over themselves. So... It's down to pure pace, but Lefterov is impressive here. The way that he's made, able to get away from that pack behind, it's making it look pretty easy, isn't it, up front? Cars working their way then up towards the end shortly of lap number 21. The gap continuing in the sectors to come down. Pavel Lefterov then hustles on, sets off now down to the hairpin. Last time around, the gap was 14 seconds. Now, what can he do about getting onto terms with the race leader? In the first sector of this lap, he's taken out 2.4 seconds alone. So it is very much on this as far as the 
lead battle is concerned. Pavel Lefterov getting closer and closer all the time. 11 minutes to go, plus a lap as he works his way now once more up towards the uh, NGK chicane. Heading into the braking zone now, ready to turn through the left, then the right, then to get back onto the power. And they'll sprint their way in a moment up once more towards turn 11 at the Coca-Cola curve. As they do so, turn out of the corner. Over the timing line, Struva threw in the 151s. The gap should be down in the middle sector. Another second pull back. And in the last sector, another second. So it's down to 9.7 now. Lefterov, I think, could we yet win this race. He's certainly going to be up with Struva by the end. But has he got the racecraft on a wet road to go offline to do the overtake that he needs in order to find a way by? I would suggest the answer is going to be yes, actually, given the way that he's been charging on to make up places in this race. As far as the championship situation is concerned, with still one weekend only to go at Misano, Jella Bielen and Marcel Nuren eighth, whereas championship rival Hausmann is third. And then Jörg Vibarn down in 10th place. Yeah, so Vibarn having another disappointing run here. He's just not really sparkled in these conditions. So the race leaders currently working that 22. There's a good BMW fight, a 66 there, which is the car of Thomas Martinson. Tries to defend from Joachim Söderström. Up towards the timing line they come. The two BMWs absolutely together. The two M3s head over the timing line pretty much as one. And now down towards the first corner. Turn one at the Mercedes Arena. Into the braking zone now goes 66. Sorry, 66, which is the Thomas Martinson driven car. But staying right with him and still looking for a way by is Joachim Söderström. And because the tail wags on the black BM, up the inside goes Söderström. Works his way past Martinson under braking. So the hard work done by Oskar Kruger, undone to an extent. And so now up one further place is Joachim Söderström. That puts him 11th. Söderström, former... A German mini challenge racer. He's raced in Swedish GT, so he's an experienced campaigner. And now having to adapt to this wet and slippery surface as the car work, cars work their way round the hairpin once again. Up towards the Bilstein curve now. Lap 23 just started by the race leaders. The gap between the top two is down to 5.8 seconds now, so it continues to come down and down and down, that gap. That's the view looking down to turn 11, the Coca-Cola curve. But where are the battles still to be decided? Jordan Witt up into eighth now at the expense of Yellow Beal. And there is the race leader, Carlson Struve, but the headlights behind herald the arrival of Pavel Lefterov. So he's going to be up with him by the end of the next lap, if not this one. They are almost together now as they work their way into the Bilstein curve. Seven and a half minutes to go. 5.8 seconds, and at four seconds a lap, two more laps, and Levrov should be through. So he's got plenty of time left in the race. It does make you wonder, though, where all the time went, because uh, Peter Terting's stint gave him a pretty good gap, and uh, Carson Struve, I would have thought, would have been able to maintain some of that, if not all of it, but he's going to drop away at the end, seemingly. But Terting was always lapping quicker than Levrov. It does make you wonder whether the Porsche in Struva's hands, just not suited to these conditions. Carsten Struva perhaps not enjoying these conditions, except he didn't do too badly this morning. And there, whoops, Lefterov breaks late and gets all crossed up going into the turn 11, but he's almost with the race leader now. It's almost happening, isn't it? So Peter Terting's good work looks like it might be undone here. There's no suggestion of a pit stop infringement for Lefterov. So as he goes over the timing line, 1.4 seconds back, he's going to get the lead on this lap down towards the right-hander at turn one they go into the Mercedes arena this time the two of them running together then as they turn now up through turn two there Jörg Vibarn busy trying to defend his place as well because he's got there right up behind him look the Camaro that's in the hands of 
Marcel Noren, and that means we've had a change. And there's the change for the lead as well, because Lefterov catches and passes the Porsche, and easy peasy through he goes. Struva unable to repel Pavel Lefterov, who goes through. So we're going to have two different winners, seemingly, unless the Lotus has a problem. Bear in mind, of course, that Lefterov was leading briefly until he got a stop go in the first race, which may have masked his pace to an extent. Here, though, he comes out of the hairpin ahead of Carsten Struva, and he made short work of him, didn't he? Because the Porsche ahead, gap left on the inside, and easily up alongside, and then threw into the lead, went Pavel left or off. From another angle, through the Mercedes arena, down towards turn three, up the inside, left or off, and Struva gave him racing room in fairness rather than moving across he didn't make life hugely difficult for him did he so that means now that Lefterov is through and clear and has got five minutes and the lap to go so he's done it in ample time so what can happen behind there number one Bernhard van Aranya coming under pressure now from Daniel Luckerman that's for fifth and sixth places as they work their way up through the Ad van Bogen into the chicane they come and Van Oranje, in theory, ought to be able to get away from Uckerman here. He's an experienced driver, but Daniel Uckerman staying with him and the black KTM, which is the better place of the two. He's ahead of his teammate, Peter Ebner, does come out of the corner, uh, almost up alongside under braking there. I was going to say he's getting closer, but then the move almost came as Uckerman had a tentative look up the inside. Now they head up past the pits over the timing line. Once again, they go. And left or off it is, then leading the way now by 1.9 seconds. Third is Luke Brahms falling away. Fourth is Rob Severs, who is catching him. Fifth is this battle now with Bernhard van Oranje under big attack from Daniel Luckerman going down towards turn one. Up the inside at turn two goes the KTM. They almost lean on each other. Van Oranje, who's already got some damage, of course, from earlier on in the race, has to give way. Uckerman goes through, but he's going to go deep into the next corner if he's not careful. But he does come out ahead. So the futuristic-looking KTM gains the place up into fifth spot. And down they come towards the hairpin. This, lap 25. Weather conditions still nasty. There's still rain in the air. So the track, a real test for the drivers, and Bernhard van Oranje there loses out a little bit going through the happy. Now, the way that Uckerman is going, he might yet get Severs before the end. Rob Severs last lap was a 1.49. Uckerman, no, he did a 1.50 on his last lap, but admittedly he was caught up in traffic. So now that he's been released from behind the number one BMW, let's see what can be done. up to the chicane the KTM charging the leader over the timing line left of already six seconds clear of Carsten Struve so the gap is widening all the while as they head down towards the Mercedes arena third and fourth it is Luke Brahms ahead of Rob Severs that gap will be given in a moment as through goes Brahms Severs is catching him it's 1.2 seconds now behind is the BMW against the Camaro and then Uckerman is five and a half seconds back but he's only lapping four tenths quicker so he's going to run out of time we've got really I suppose now time for three more laps in the race Peter Ebner though is looking pretty good he is lapping quicker than Bernhard van Oranje by over three seconds a lap and he's got 7.8 to make up I don't think he's going to get there in time but he's having another good go to try and bring down that gap sufficiently So we had the first Porsche victory in a long, long time, if not ever, earlier on in the day. Porsche wins in GT4 have never been that common, but it was a very good result, Carson Struve and Peter Terting. But now it's going to be a third Lotus win, seemingly. Pavel Lefterov has had a couple of victories this year, and another one beckons for him, working his way on lap 26. There, though, is the fight for third, with the gap coming down and down and down. You can see Luke Brahms under attack because now Rob Severs is getting closer and closer to him all the while as they work their way up now once more through the Bilstein curva up towards the Ad Van Bogen, the right-hander. The BMW's pace is good, but can Rob Severs be bold enough to launch himself up the inside and make that move? Let's see. Not at the chicane, he can't. 
but a much better race this for the combined efforts of Hausman and Brahms compared to race one where Luke Brahms faded away early on and there was just no chance for Hausman to get back into the mix. The leaders go by, two more laps, the time will be up this time and then it's plus one lap. Here's for third place. This could yet change before the end. Luke Brahms over the timing line in the Chevrolet ahead of the BMW of Rob Severs, the BMW dealer. Lining up to have a go as they head down towards turn one, but Severs there not really able to make a move on the inside line. In fifth spot, Daniel Uckerman, who is still closing, but uh, I was going to say not quickly enough. He's brought the gap down by very nearly two seconds and he's got to make up 3.7 more. So there, look, in the background, the black KTM is not actually out of the hunt after all. So the race leaders on to lap 27. There's going to be time for one more at the end of this. 50 minutes plus one lap for duration. And for third and fourth places still, Luke Brahms defending from Rob Severs, but as they come down towards the hairpin, Severs closes up a little bit. So the BMW on the back of Brahms. And up through the Bilstein curve they come. The clock has hit zero then. So the last lap will be started very shortly by Pavel Levdorov. But what's going to happen here as far as third and fourth places are concerned. The battle not done yet. Up towards the chicane. A challenge on the inside there by Rob Severs. Can't do it. Tucks back in behind, but he might have a better run out of the corner. And behind them, Uckerman working his way up through traffic as well, trying to join this mix. One side and then the other goes the BMW. Rob Severs then still trying to find a way past Luke Brahms as they work their way up towards the line. The leaders have gone through, then onto the last lap of the race. A big, big sideways moment there from Luke Brahms as he works his way up towards the line. And does that give Rob Severs a chance to challenge on the way down towards turn one? Behind them, still fifth and doing his best to close, Daniel Uckerman. And in the gloom, they come to the Mercedes Arena. It's the last of the late breakers, but Brahms will hang on to the place then. Stands his ground, keeps the position. Through the corner they go. He is third still, but Rob Severs working ever so hard. Too hard, though, on the last lap, a mistake made. And that, I'm afraid, now means that the car falls away. So he's on the money again now, down to turn three. But instead of challenging, he's trying to regain the lost ground. And another mistake made under braking there as the car just gets away from him ever so slightly. Rob Severs then. A quick am, BMW dealer, fishtails his way out of turn four, down towards the hairpin now. Heading into the braking zone, can he make a move up on the inside? Let's see. Not there, he can't. Luke Brahms hangs onto the place. For Pavel Lefteroff, though, having had the two victories at Spa, it looks as though it's going to be another dream result here. He's also, of course, the leading uh, am, so it's going to be a class win as well as an overall win for him. Out of the Bilstein curve for the last time comes the third and fourth place battle. I suppose really now Rob Severs' best chance is to try to pressure a mistake out of Luke Brahms into the last corner, out of which comes Pavel Lefterov. He's on target for a third win of the season. And the Lotus Evora is going to win with a delighted Pavel Lefterov at the wheel of it. He comes across the line to take the race win. A great drive that by Lefterov. A solo effort ahead of Carsten Struve and Peter Terting. And then for third, we're not done yet. Brahms versus Rob Severs as they come through the Coca-Cola curve. Turn 11. On the power is the sideways Brahms, but I think he's got enough in hand. Here they come up towards the timing line. The Camaro just fends off the BMW, but only just as they got to the timing line. And another very close battle behind Uckerman fifth, but then just sixth. Bernhard van Oranje ahead of Peter Ebner, a fifth of a second between those two. There are the two race winners of the day. The Porsche of Carson Struve and Peter Terting and the Lotus of Pavel Lefterov that scores victory in this second race of the weekend in the European GT4 Series. Another very intriguing race. And considering that we had in the end uh, only 13 starters, there was always quite a lot going on. But Peter Terting must be a little bit frustrated there. He did all that he could to give Carson Struve a big advantage. But in the end, it just was not enough. And so coming through for the race win, the Lotus in the hands of Pavel Lefterov.
and two more races to go in the championship. That's all. So the teams will head next to Masano in early October, where surely the weather has got to be better than it's been here at the Nürburgring this weekend. And then the championship will be decided. But it is to be hoped that the European GT4 series continues to go from strength to strength. It's one of those hidden gems. And once people have taken part in it, they suddenly realize how good it is. And the racing is good at a number of very good venues. And Pavel Lefterov winning for Lotus and really celebrating on the run up towards the chequered flag. So Lefterov the winner, Tetting and Struva second, Hausman and Brahms third, Knapp and Seves fourth, fifth, Uckerman, sixth, Van der Ender and Van Orania, seventh, Halleck and Ebner, eighth, Witt and Clatton, ninth, Vibarn, tenth, Bielen and Nuren, eleventh, Lundstrom and Söderström. In the end, twelfth to Hack and Rickness, and then in 13th place in the end was the BMW that got delayed on the last few laps and fell away in the hands of uh, Oscar Kruger and Thomas Martinson.
Bewertung, ein Jahr der Bewertung. Da dürfen wir also aufrufen. Unseren drittplatzierten Congratulations on the third place von Promenade Racing, Milton Lundström und Joachim Donnerström. Der zweitplatzierte von Zabo Lenko aus Aufwandmeier und Ausgleichstern. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Daniel Ockermann. Lauftsieger und Gesamtsieger der Amateurwertung, der Anwertung hier auf dem Nürburgring beim zweiten Rennen. Congratulations for the victory from our people after racing, Pavel Lefero. Das erfolgreiche Team darf natürlich nicht fehlen aus der Gesamtwertung. Vom ASC Bull After Racing, Congratulations, Gabriele Castellassi. So stehen Sie hier oben und zu Ehren des Siegers erklingt nun die bulgarische Nationale. Dort oben dürfen Sie also jetzt strahlen und wir beginnen mit der Pokalübergabe auf der dritten Position und da wird André Scheuer, der CEO der GT4 European Series, die Trophäe überreichen, wenn Sie denn mal eine anreichen würde. Also ich denke mal, ach, da steht, da steht ja schon da, richtig, genau. Dritter Platz, herzlichen Glückwunsch an Milton Lundström und Joachim Soderström. Ich habe mich ganz vergessen, dass Sie schon da stehen, sorry. Zweite Platz in diesem Durchgang. Bernd Kurznig, Vorstandsmitglied für Finanzen des ADAC Westfalen, überreicht die Trophäe, die ja schon davor steht, haben wir gelernt, an den Zweitplatzierten. Herzlichen Glückwunsch, Daniel Uckermann. Und andere Schweiß darf noch einmal verabschiedet werden für den Lauftiger in diesem Durchgang. Congratulations for the victory, Pavel Lefkerau. für das erfolgreiche Team und das ist die Mannschaft von ASC Bulafto Racing. Congratulations, Gabriele Castellassi. <laughs> Gentlemen, you put a little bit together on the podium, please, for the photographers. Drop it in your hands. Yeah, that's great. And einmal an die Barriere. Please come to the barrier in front of you. If you want to do it. So, da würde ich sagen, es ist Zeit, es ist angerichtet. Gentlemen, it's time for Champagne an die Platte. Da haben Sie also allesamt Ihren Platz gehabt hier an dieser Ehrung inklusive des dazugehörigen Champagners, des Wechsels. Congratulations an, den, an den Aufsieger, Gesamtsieger muss man ja sagen, und der Anwertung, die wir ebenfalls ja mit dazu getragen haben. Und so heißt es jetzt dann in Richtung der Probe zu schauen. Es wird noch einen Augenblick dauern, bis wir da dann eben halt übergehen können. Und so ist es wieder Ehrung. Da wird natürlich jetzt erstmal ein kleines bisschen noch aufgebaut. Insofern, als dass wir auch im Hintergrund natürlich arbeiten müssen. Das heißt also, wir werden tatsächlich dann auch die Fahnen logischerweise ein bisschen mit austauschen müssen, damit wir die richtigen Fahnen da unten hängen haben. Und so stehen also unsere Pokale und Flaschen nun alle parat auf dem Podium. Gefüllt wird das Ganze jetzt durch die Fahrer aus der Probewertung auf dem Treppchen. Und wir beginnen auch hier auf Rang 3. Congratulations on third place from Equus Motorsport. Simon Knapp, Rob Sivas. Die Zweitplatzierten. Congratulations from the second place from B8 Racing. Danke Neustadt und Luke Barth. 
Und wie bereits heute Morgen dürfen wir Sie auch jetzt auf dem Treppchen ganz oben begrüßen. Von Großbord Performance herzlichen Glückwunsch, Peter Terzing und Carsten Strube. Auch hier haben Sie Einzug gehalten auf dem Treppchen und zu Ehren der Sieger nun die nationale Hymne der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Das Strahlen aus den Gesichtern ist jetzt auf den Bildern festgehalten. Und angezeigt hier auf der European European Series, darf die Trophäen überreichen für die Drittplatzierten. Herzlichen Glückwunsch zu Rang 3. Congratulations, Simon Stapp, Rob Silva. Für den Zweitplatzierten ist Klaus Rasenbus, Vorstandsmitglied für Ortsclubs des ADAC Westfalen. An der Reihe. Ihnen die Trophäen zu überreichen. Wir sagen herzlichen Glückwunsch. Congratulations for the second place. Danke in Deutschland. Look brav. Und so darf Angel Schweiz noch einmal seines Amtes weichen für die Aufstieger. Den Doppelsieg perfekt gemacht an diesem Sonntag hier am Nürburgring. Wir sagen herzlichen Glückwunsch. Peter Gersing, Carsten Trube. Und ich habe einen Wunsch für die TP4. Wir würden gerne in die Werbung gehen. Wir würden gerne in die Werbung gehen. 